Today what I'll be talking about is the neural correlates of social competency and emotion regulation in childhood and adolescence. So first, I'd just like to define social competency and how I'll be using it throughout this presentation. Um, social competency really can be thought of as a combination of interest in, engagement with, and skills in. And just to illustrate what I mean by this, I'd like to play a, a brief video clip with two different characters who each showed what I think are differing levels of this social competency measure. Uh, just pay attention, if you will, to the way the two characters interact and, and how they're different in those three dimensions. <laughs> It's my ex-boss. So, as I mentioned, how different um, individuals can be on this measure. On one hand, we see Felix. Felix is uh, happy and interested in engaging Oscar in a social interaction. He asks him about his day, he's what's happened, and he does this in a pretty skillful way. Oscar, on the other hand, is he's upset. Um, he doesn't want to engage Felix at all. He doesn't want to answer questions and doesn't seem very good at, in responding uh, or using communication skills effectively. Uh, I think that the social competency measure really is an interesting in individual difference um, for examining social processing and emotional experiences. So um, we all experience a wide range of emotions. And many of them can be slightly challenging. Um, one example could be consoling a friend who may be experiencing the death of a loved one. Another example could be giving a presentation in front of a group of peers and prospective advisors right before you apply a graduate school. <laughs> but the important thing is that these are incredibly challenging social and emotional situations. And I'm curious what can help individuals manage these effectively? I'm especially curious about what I said is a transitional period, um, especially as we move from childhood to adolescence. This change uh, comes with an incredible number of intense social and emotional changes. One thing we have a desire for autonomy as we leave our nuclear family and start to seek out different groups with our peers. We also know, and many people have are incredibly sensitive to emotion, both positive and negative. And so when you put those together, people are finding new social situations and experiencing new and intense and salient emotions. So competencies, especially in the social domain, might help these individuals manage those experiences adaptively. So as I see it, I think that um, social competency leads to emotion regulation in at least two ways. The first could be a story about emotional control involving cognitive and other high-level processes, things like perspective-taking, inferring the intentions of others, and behavioral control. Social competency is related to these types of phenomena, which activity in the dorsal and lateral prefrontal uh, regions in response to some kind of social and emotional stimuli tracking the social competency. On the other hand, the story could be about bottom-up emotional appraisal activity. Processes like low-level somatosensory information processing, the evaluative activity in subcortical regions like the amygdala, or even you know, like the insula. So, 
in light of these ideas and these two um, possibilities, we started crafting a, a couple of different hypotheses that guided the research um, that I'm about to present to you. So, the first is that social competency would predict less negative aspects to viewing socio-emotional and emotionally evocative stimuli. Next, we hypothesized that neural recruitment in one of the regions that I mentioned would be related to the measure that I've already discussed. And finally, we predicted that these results will be stronger for our participants than our uh, younger participants because these, these skills are especially important in adolescents and in ma managing these new and emerging social and emotional experiences. So we measured social competency using the childhood behavior. You're all very familiar with this. Um, it measures a number of different things, but uh, it also measures competency in three important domains. In, in activities, in academics, and then also in a social domain. And as I mentioned in the first slide, the, the social domain um, for competency in the CBCL really takes into account interest in social interaction, engagement with other people in social interaction, and skill in dealing with those situations. We took data um, from that we gained with the CBCL and matched it up with data we got from a well-established fMRI socio-emotional probing paradigm. 65 participants, ages 6 to 17, were instructed on different ways of thinking about them, and they were shown different types of social stimuli. Uh, some of them were very negative. They showed um, threatening images. People they were upset at one another, uh, or they were just neutral. But both types of images were social. After they were shown images of the they were asked to make rating of each image. Using this scale shown, the question asked, how bad do you feel? And they reported this on a 1 to 5 scale. 1 means not bad at all, and 5 means very bad. a brief behavioral result that we found using these data. What we found was that across all three types of viewing conditions, individuals high competency were rating images as less emotionally aversive. So they rated them low with the social competency score across ages. Using that behavioral result as a springboard, um, then wanted to understand what types of neural correlates we could find, what activation in the brain would also track with social competence. And, uh, leaning on what I mentioned before as the two possibilities, we were surprised not to find any activity in the prefrontal regions that I mentioned, but instead we found it in the anterior insula, as shown here. This image is shown from a whole brain analysis. Um, the cluster is 19 and it's thresholded at the p equals 0 0.005 level. And here I show the beta weights uh, for this exact same analysis using social competency score as a covariate and insula activation for viewing emotionally evocative social images over neutral social images. And so what we're seeing here is greater insula interacting with social competency. So those who are more socially competent are, in, are recruiting their insula to a greater degree than those who are less socially competent. It's also interesting that the values lie above zero. So that I think what that shows is the insula is uh, picking up on the saliency of, I think, the most social images that we've shown. So we also wanted to understand, as I mentioned, whether there were any development Looking at the same plot that I showed before, broken up by age, what we see is that the slopes aren't actually significantly different as I thought they would be. But we do find that the relationship between insula activation and social competency, when viewing these aversive social images versus neutral social images, um, is much stronger for our adolescent participants, shown here in blue, than our children participants, shown in red. 
possibly due to greater variation of children uh, grouping you can see, but I think it's important to note that the relationship is stronger and only significant in the adolescence. It's the fact that in this group, it's probably required to have greater social competency in order to manage the kinds of interactions that these people are first encounter and learning and better at dealing with. So, I want to point out and reiterate that social competency relates to the neural ability to recognize salient aspects of the social environment. And it will be that um, the increased activation is showing that these high so highly socially competent individuals are also activate or emotional state, and then maybe they're having a, an easier time of integrating their social environment with their own mental state. And in the end, this can make less negative judgments about the social environment. And last, I did show that there's some possible developmental trends that we'd like to explore further. So in the future, we'd like to answer this exact uh, question that we've been examining using longitudinal data. We're exploring fun functional connectivity to examine insula prefrontal dynamics the social competency measure, and emotional regulation. And last, I'm really interested in combining this idea of social competency with other real-world measures and behavioral outcomes in sort of a natural social environment. So, uh, thank you all so much for listening. I'm excited about uh, this new direction that we've been going. Uh, I think our lab at Columbia, Kevin and Jen, Especially our collaborators to analyze these data. Um, Flux for inviting me to come give this brief presentation. And of course, our funding agency, the National Institute of Health and Development. Thank you so much. Time for a few questions. Sorry, it's me again. Uh, Deanna Martin, wash you. Um, uh, very nice study. Can, can you say a little bit about um, what social competency also related to? And it, I'd be surprised that I'm wondering about like depression and anxiety level relationship with the insulin activation holds if you account for their depression or anxiety levels. Sure, it's a great idea. Um, one thing that I'll mention is that all variability in any type of uh, measure related to psychopathology. It's a really interesting direction, but I think is a natural way for us to go with this next. Um, and I'm excited to see how. Kate McLaughlin from the University of Washington. Fantastic talk. Very great work. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about whether you found any relationship between social competency and the, um, the contrast between the far versus close when they were actually trying to distance versus um, sort of closer than social images. Yeah, so I'm really happy that you brought that up. We didn't find any differences across the three conditions, um, which I think helped us sort of rule out the top-down control idea or possibility that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, one thing I would mention, though, is that um, we might see a little bit of an effect with the look condition, where participants are uh, using basically an uninstructed control sort of um, strategy for viewing images. Thank okay. you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.